Welcome to SOS Stolen Object Stories online conference. I am Margarida Saraiva, a founding member of Babel, a non-profit cultural organization whose mission is to generate learning and research opportunities in the fields of art, architecture, and environment. We are based in Macau, China, but we also operate in Shanghai, Lisbon, and Porto. I would like to start uh, this conference by um, showing my gratitude towards the funders and the partners. I want to thank in particular the Macau Cultural Affairs Bureau for the generous funding of the project the Faculty of Arts and Humanities of St. Joseph University, where we are today now, and the Heritage Department of, Mac of the Macau Institute for Tourism Studies. I want to thank our speakers and moderators. The speakers, Zweng Zeng Liu, Luis Kitakot, Caroline Atuk, Rixa Afiati, Sita Magfira, Catarina Simão, Marian Pastor Rosses, Naman Auja, and Maria Paula Menezes, and the moderators, Shen Wida and Akiko Sujiyama. I will have the opportunity to introduce all the guests later on, just before their presentation, but for now, and to all and each of you, thank you very much for being here with us. A special thanks also for Tiago, Quadros, Rui Borges, and my students of Heritage Management for the support with all the logistics, as well as VA Studio for the conception of the design. The upcoming three-day conference will allow us to enter a conversation about stolen object stories as the first step towards the constitution of a critical archive and a discursive platform which aims at taking a closer look at stories, practices and discourses about stolen objects, searching for new relation, new relations among knowledges emerging from different fields. Now, you may ask me exactly what do I mean by object or what do I mean by archive? To help us out with this answer, and since this project is still on purpose, on, on process, sorry, I wrote a small fiction which is entirely true. I have started writing a curator's diary. I hope to register the absurdity of daily gestures and thoughts. I wake up to the news. 300 new cameras started to be installed today as part of the fifth phase of Eyes in the Sky. Local authorities plan to have 2,600 surveillance cameras installed in the city by the end of 2023 and 4,200 by 2028 to cover the city 32.9 square kilometers. Two artworks come to mind. The first one is titled The Omnipresence of Text. It's a wor work inspired by Ether, which is a science fiction novel writ written by Zheng Ren, a Chinese writer born in 1981, describing a world in which everything is under surveillance. Therefore, in the novel, citizens develop a unique language based on touch to speak to each other which they do only in the dark. Wang, Wang Wenyo, an artist with whom I usually work here in Macau, 
uh, uses quotes from these novels and print them in small credit card papers. Using a black marker, the artist blocks parts of the text. The visible ones will soon disappear, but the black strokes used to block specific passage will not disappear as quickly. Another artwork that comes to mind is the one by Maria Molina Peiró. It's titled One Ear Life's Prova. Carrying a wearable camera, the artist takes a photo every 30 seconds during a whole year. The enormous collections of photos registered by the camera are shown to the vi viewers in an inter interactive archive that instead of remember produces a creative amnesia of our digital memory. One Ear Life's Brava is a sort of a digital geology which mines the data from the strata and investigates one ear of the artist's own life through an artificial intelligent vision sy system which, is, which does not focus on the artist's personal life. On the, on the contrary, the AI focuses on the collection of patterns and numbers they contain. The project is composed of four steps. The first, sedimentation. The second, stratification. The third, mining. And the fourth, fossification. I may have lost the capacity to see the world as it is, as I feel that I can only see it through art. While I drink my morning coffee images from the special operation of Russia in Ukraine or the invasion of Ukraine, depending on each side you stand, enter my room and penetrate my eyes and neurons for years to come. All of this is happening through cameras and screens without which we would not have been here today. Judith Butler urges her readers to understand how cameras work as instruments of war, as actual weapons through which violence is executed on population. On population, she speaks of drone war. Yesterday, I tested for the SOS conference, and one of the speakers pointed out that this is also a war of images. They are all white, blonde, and with blue eyes. Walking to the dining room, I crash into a small table near my bed, and a pile of, of books fall on the floor, including my passport. Holding my travel document, I feel like looking at a museological object. It was early 2019 when I left this town for the last time. The boat ticket which took me to the neighboring city of Hong Kong has entirely faded. I can no longer confirm the exact date I left, I left the city. Almost three years have passed and I continue to cooperate with the authorities that discourage leaving town due to a zero COVID cases policy. I run to the museum and I am late again. I prepared the health code, but no, oh no, it's yellow. Oh, I forgot my acid nucleic test once again. I am not allowed to enter the museum nor any other public space. I finally sit looking towards the sea after paying my dues with my mobile phone because we are no longer using money. If this me fictional description sounded like science fiction for some of you, for others like me, it might be 
just daily life. And I'm sharing my gestures and thoughts with you because I think they matter. They matter as affects, they matter as symptoms, they matter as portraits of our time. When I say affect from the Latin affectus, I mean, a, I mean as it, wa it was used and conceptualized by Spinoza, Bergson, Deleuze, and Guattari, placing the emphasis on embodied experience. When I say symptom, I mean it in medical terms, a subjective evidence of a disease, a sense of confusion, disorientation, or even despair, which describes our present. But when I mean portrait, I mean a record of certain like, 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 likeness of something that is either alive or dead, a dead nature maybe. These gestures matter because they lay down the ground from which the urgency to start wondering how to live otherwise emerges. And as a historian, I tend to look at archives. They have been well guarded by those entrusted with the right to interpret the information they contain. This idea echoes Derrida and his reflection in his archive fever, a Freudian impression. Archive, Greek noun, refers to a house where official documents were filed and kept. The archons were those who, in, who were invested with the authority and power to access and interpret its content. These history lead us to think that they are to be seen as the origin from which order is given as a totalizing assemblage or the institution that lays down what can be said as Michel Foucault has suggested. But archives are by no means static or stable and are never immune to internal contradiction or is external disruptions. While traditional archives tend to be defined to, through a context specific accumulation of material, conforming to an existing order and narrative which do not transform their structure. Other practices have emerged, changing our understanding of what an archive could be. I am thinking about non-traditional archives, more dynamic types, capable of being performed and staged in multiple ways, capable of producing new knowledge, in particular, I am thinking about curatorial archives. A series of questions can be raised about curatorial archives, and I will just um, list some of them that were formulated by other researchers and curators. How do curators understand, create, and use archives? What are the old and new ways of conceiving, structuring, curating, and displaying archives? What testimony of our times can we archive, can an archive offer to future generations of curators, researchers, and intellectuals? Should we be afraid about should we be afraid of talking about emotions when discussing curatorial archives? What are the boundaries between documentation, artwork, archive, collection, personal and public, freelance and institution that we should consider when approaching the issue of curatorial archives? Can the archive be a tool for the rediscovering individual methodologies to be transformed in collective thinking. We are looking here at the possibility of creating an archive as a decentralized assemblage of stories and histories, not only about museum objects in the context of robbery, war, colonialism, occupations of any kind, 
borders the definition, but also an archive of reflections and eventually affects about the process through which human, animals, and plants became image, objects, and data for artificial intelligence, sedimentation, stratification, mining, and fossilization, a process that is also forming the basis for a new coloniality and a new domination. We are conscious that we are producing more data, which will serve a larger archive and may soon be fossilized. SOS approaches this urgency through stories, practices, and discourses. We start way back in the past, and we want to explore possible futures. If we take the object as a, a starting point, then we are already starting with a very problematic concept. An object implies, always implies a subject as well as a certain materiality. But in computer science, however, the object is the unity in which data and function are combined. This is certainly a topic to be developed elsewhere. For the time being, we hope that SOS as a critical archive can be staged, performed, gazed from different perspectives, and as an open source of prismatic figurations, explorations, fictional, fictional rehearsals of other possible futures. Stephen Madoff argued in 2021 for the need for curatorial and institutional activism, highlighting the fact that in order to be effective in the post-truth era, cultural institutions have to ask themselves before anything else, whose truth is it that they are engaging with? And if you ask me, but whose truth are we engaging with, then I will tell you that, that SOS expresses the desire to de-universalize and de-neutralize the rigid epistemic schemata of inherited disciplines. It is built in collaboration with more than a dozen researchers, artists, historians, poets, and musicians from Uruguay to Australia with the aim at highlighting the interconnectedness and the interdependence of small places scattered around the world without seeking to offer a globalizing vision. In the same way, the truth that is being sought here is the subjective truth of each of the co-authors of this archive. We offer a platform in which authors within a very loose framework can contribute in, in formats as text, image, sounds, and videos exploring topics around stolen heritage and other stolen objects, contemporary practices and associated discourses related to their immediate context their own locations, but highlighting the interconnectedness we live in. Today, however, our focus is not on objects as subjects, neither as objects as data, but museum objects and heritage. And we will be starting in China, the place from where we speak today. We are considering how could we expand from the care of objects to the respect for people, from caring for museums, collections, and heritage to the care for communities, nature, and the planet, from the care for objects, materiality, to the conditions of making. How could we move from a notion of object possession to one of shared ownership? from provenance to transit, from a history of power and violence to one of justice and peace. 